passage of Scripture. Uh, it's one that's very familiar to all of us, right? Um, we, uh, in kids' ministry, we see the picture of Jesus as the good shepherd. He's got that, you know, the paintings always have that faraway look in his eye. <laughs> he's got, thank you, bro. Uh, faraway look in his eye. Uh, he's got the, you know, the crook in one hand, and he's got a little woolly in his other arm. And uh, we've all seen that picture, right? And it's a, a great picture for uh, young children to see and think about their strong shepherd. Um, as, I think as we come to adulthood, we have to kind of jettison a little bit our preconceived ideas about Psalm 23. We've grown up in a church. We've seen the picture. As we grow older, we don't want to miss the power and the grit and the real-life nature of Psalm 23. That's something we don't want to miss. Um, this is some of David. David was a king. He, he was a great warrior. He was a leader. He was a fighter. He was a shepherd. And he knew it was like to be in difficult situations and to see God deliver him again and again. So this isn't some quiet, super soft, fluffy, spiritual song, even though it is usually for children. I'm going to say, let's, let's make sure that the adults don't lose the message. Oh, yeah, we've got Psalm 23. We could quote it for you. you know, every time we go to a funeral, we hear it read. And we want to take a fresh look at Psalm 23 again this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for uh, your word, Lord, and so many passages of Scripture, Lord. We, we especially focus on this passage this morning and uh, the tenacious song from someone who lived life, really his whole life, uh, his future was hanging in the balance, and what uh, kept him from destruction was just a complete trust in you. Um, and it, in David's life, it came through again and again and again. And Lord, sometimes we are less like David than we really ought to be. Uh, we, we need to, to find David again and, and use his example as a person after God's own heart uh, for ourselves, for our lives, for the situations we find ourselves in, uh, to be like the King of Israel who was so much like the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and ultimately, he's the one we want to become like. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, invitation is powerful. Paul opens his... Uh, 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 David opens the psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, we want to stop and just think for a moment. I have a shepherd, and he, here's the key about this text I don't want to miss. All of us have some kind of shepherd in our lives. We were created by God for God, and if God isn't leading our life, that doesn't mean that someone else isn't leading it. We're made by Him to be led. So if He's not leading, somebody else is. Some teacher, some person that we really look up to. And I would suggest that we need to actually come to the place where David was. He was surrounded by men, godly men, men that loved the Lord. But he realized that they were not his shepherd. There was only one shepherd, and that was the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He brings our eyes to focus on that which transcends the whole human race in that Jehovah is my shepherd. He is the one to whom I am following. He is the one who's always got my back. Whenever I'm in difficulty, it is the shepherd, my shepherd, Jehovah, that transcends all the rest. We talk about all the wisdom of man, and we get on the internet, and everybody's blogging about blah, blah, blah. Everybody's an expert. What kind of shepherds are we following? Now, some of us think we're our own shepherd, right? That's, uh, uh, I am my shepherd. I don't want. I'm my own shepherd. 
I tried that for the first 22 years of my life. D didn't work out so good. Came to a point where I realized I'm making a mess out of everything in my life. Everything is turning into, you know, just a, a mud puddle of mess. And I needed God to forgive me and give me a new life. This morning, you might be in the same situation. Uh, I am my shepherd. I don't want. I would suggest that maybe you should consider and think through the idea of maybe it might be better that the Lord be your shepherd than you yourselves are your own shepherds. Or some, you know, some intelligentsia person who's going to give us the counsel that just uncracks every mystery in our, eye, in our eyes. I would say there's a greater shepherd than any human, and that's the Lord himself. We think sometimes we're calling the shots. Congratulations, you're your own shepherd. Um, in, in those 22 years without the Lord being my shepherd, I thought I was in control, and I decided what I was going to be. And uh, I've come to realize that that was a mess and that I needed God's grace. You and I have that opportunity. Can we just pause here for a moment? You have an opportunity to, to understand this perspective from somebody who actually knew the shepherd and walked with the shepherd for a, a time of, of, of challenge as far as salvation is concerned. If you're here, here this morning and you say, yeah, I kind of like the idea of a shepherd and maybe following him. How do I do that? To as many as he, he, he gave uh, faith to, those are the ones that, that are saved by God. We are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Trust in the Lord and be saved. What does that mean to trust in the Lord? It means that I believe that I'm a sinner that there is no way that I can be righteous on my own, that I need God's righteousness to forgive my sins and also to establish a standing before me that God has said in his word, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, that God provided a righteousness for those who would trust in him for salvation. Every single person who puts their faith in Christ will not be disappointed, and they will have a, a future along with him in heaven. If you're without the Savior, don't leave this place without making a decision for Jesus. The most important decision you could ever make in your life. You can only mock the idea of the Lord is my shepherd until you have a personal relationship with that shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I laid down my life for the sheep, and that's exactly what he did. So this morning, if you're without Christ, you make a decision right now for him and trust in him. What does that look like? It might look different for different people, but trusting in him is, uh, there's a moment in my life that I remember that I received Christ as my savior and I trusted in him as my Lord. I, I recognized that I was done living my life for myself. I needed his forgiveness and I asked Jesus to save me. Have you made that decision? This morning would be a great time, even during the message this morning. David experienced the pro a process of knowing the Lord as his shepherd. And really, this psalm is a testimony of David's faith. Um, we, we see it. It's, it's, it's an interesting psalm because it's from the perspective of who? The sheep. The Lord is my shepherd, all right? Uh, now, the people who are strained at logic would say, well, this seems to be a uh, faulty personification here. <laughs> the sheep are talking about their shepherd. Yeah, because when David looked back on his life, he didn't write this as a young person. He wrote it as a, as, as a man who saw God deliver him one time after another time after another time. And as he sat down to write this song, he started to realize just like I was a shepherd boy on the hillside of Judea, God's been watching me the whole time and taking care of me. And, and the Lord is my shepherd, and those are the first five words of the psalm. 
it's not just the first statement in this beloved psalm. It's the explanation of the whole psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. It's an apt analogy written from the viewpoint of the sheep. It's not exactly a compliment for us. All right? Let's look at some of the things that it says you know, about sheep and, and people who know sheep know this very well. That sheep lack a sense of direction, right? The sheep get lost easily. Sheep are virtually defenseless. Most animals have claws. They have sharp teeth. Uh, sheep have none of that. Uh, they're running around with like a love seat of wool on their back. <laughs> and they can't get away from anybody. They can't get away from themselves. When the shepherd calls them, they run over each other to get towards the shepherd, right? The, the shepherd. The sheep are like easy prey. And David looks at that and says, without my shepherd watching over me, I'd be dead meat every day of the week. And look at the things that David was able, God was able to accomplish through David's life, uh, his life of ministry. Sheep are easily frightened. They're very aware of their weakness. Sheep are by nature unclean. They are uh, filthy indefinitely until the shepherd washes them, they're going to be dirty. Uh, they stink. When, they, when the Israel came into Egypt, they put them up in Goshen because they didn't want to hit, smell the smelly sheep. Um, sheep cannot find food or water. They will graze in one spot until there's nothing left on that spot and not move on to the next spot. That's, that's us. That's David's perspective. That's us. The sheep's wool does not belong to the sheep. It belongs to the shepherd. So those are some of the apt analogy points. And let's get into just a quick explanation because I want to spend most of our time this morning looking at verse 5. All right? It's a verse that sometimes we, we don't spend a lot of time on, and we're going to almost spend the whole message on verse 5. But verse 1, the Lord's my shepherd I shall not want. Here's what F.B. Meyer said about this verse. All other life from the aphid on the rose leaf to the archangel before the throne is dependent and derived. All others waste, change, and grow old. He only is unchangeably the same. All others are fires which he supplies with fuel. He alone is self-sustained. This mighty being is our shepherd. That's verse 1. Verse 2, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides still waters. David's starts with this pastoral picture of a sheep under the shepherd's care. Verse 3, he, he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Restoration. He restores my soul. He, when we think of the soul, you think of the body, uh, the soul, and the spirit, right? We don't really have a spirit. We have a fake spirit until the day we accept Christ. If this morning you prayed to receive Jesus Christ... God not only saved you, but also indwelt you with his Holy Spirit. That will happen every, at the moment you accept Christ as your Savior. It's an endowment. Up to that point, we were spiritually dead, separated from God. The moment we accept Jesus Christ, we are alive in the Spirit. But there's always a soul and a body. And the soul is our mentality, our thinking. He restores our soul in a sense of restoring our thinking ability, coming to the right conclusions about life. Only God can give us the right perspective about life. Man doesn't come up with himself. His sin nature always exalts himself and diminishes God. That's, that's humanism. Uh, it was interesting. Two, uh, I preached a sermon one time that the, the tale of two revolutions, the American Revolution starts that we were all created by God and endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are written in our Declaration of Independence. A few years later, France had their Declaration of the Rights of Man. That was their version of their Declaration of Independence. And there is no place in the whole document that it ever mentions God or even alludes to God. Everything is man. Everything is man-centered. Oh, we are great. We are wonderful. That's the way we always look at things. That's our perspective. That's our problem, really. It's our arrogance. It was interesting that our uh, 
revolution led to people being liberated and a tremendous freedom that n the world has never known politically in all the annals of history and, and all around the globe, all 24 time zones. No one has ever seen freedom like that came in uh, because liberty was something that we realized that God gave us. Uh, and people are trying to retell history today. Don't believe it. We were founded as a nation that trusted God for everything. It was like, the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. And, and in, in, in France, not to go re-preach this other message, it was chaos. Whenever we forget about God and we deify man, it always leads to disorder, chaos, lawlessness. And what happens after lawlessness? After people are fed up with lawlessness, eventually people have to crack down on it. And that's exactly what happened in France. And all of a sudden they had the ministry of truth to tell everybody the way they were supposed to think about everything. It looks a lot like America 2024. And the guillotine for anybody who disagreed. Uh, unfortunately, we're on that path right now. Hopefully, there's time for us to repent and to turn away from that foolishness. Um, so, restoration. He restores my soul. Verse, 20, uh, verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Uh, that route that the shepherd takes his sheep on every year, David knew it well, he would take them from where they would graze in the wintertime, and then as the summer came and the sun hit the land, there was the snows that would melt that changed where the green grass would be, and it meant the flock had to walk to where that new grass was. And David knew it well, and the path was always treacherous. It was the valley of the shadow of death. The little woolies, if they had the ability to think through this, and David now is personifying it and saying, Though, yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's, that's the key. And it's not to the valley of the shadow of death. It is through it. And he's leading with his rod and his staff. Verse 5, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. The, 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 the allegory or the analogy of sh the the Lord and the, his being the shepherd and we being the sheep begins to change here in, chap, in verse 5. There's a magnificent table in the presence of enemies that's described. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Alexander McLaren, a great Scott preacher, said, This is the condition of God's servant. Always conflict, but always a spread table. <laughs> I like that. This is the condition of God's servant. Always conflict, but always a spread table. And verse 6, surely goodness and mercy, loving kindness, <laughs> said as Pastor John said last week, will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. F.B. Meyer refers to goodness and loving kindness as the celestial escort, the two that follow after us. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. All the days of my life, the goodness and mercy are always behind me. We led one preacher to say, goodness and mercy are like God's two sheepdogs that follow us wherever we go. Goodness and mercy, always reminding us, we got you. And don't go off the path, we got you. Nipping at our heels when we go the wrong way and keeping us together with the rest of the sheep. I like that. Carol's going to like that, too. God's sheepdog. Yeah, she's, anything uh, that woofs and has four legs, Carol loves. Uh, so when we recognize the Lord is my shepherd, we come to know he makes us lie down in green pastures uh, because we all need green pastures, don't we? Uh, we, we need God's refreshment. Uh, the frustrating part is he's telling us right away that uh, I'm referring to you as sheep, and that's not particularly a compliment, as we already mentioned. If we're honest, we don't see well. We don't always make great decisions. We're not super steady on our feet. Uh, 
we need help. That's why we need a shepherd. And when the, the most pitiful time is the people who act like they, they, don't, don't, they don't need a shepherd. Right? God's put us in this position where this truth is actually so on target. It tells us exactly what life was meant to be from God's perspective and how we're failing every time we think we can handle it by ourselves. When we forget that we need a shepherd. We, got, we have some operative words here. He's going to lead me beside still waters. He's going to restore my soul. He's going to guide me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, throw, walk through the valley of shadow of death. Thou art with me. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You're, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. <clears throat> and we fi find the end of that passage. David is totally convinced I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And everyone who trusts in Christ has that same faith. That we're, we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We, look, we love verse 5, and I want to focus on it because that's really where the, what the journey is all about. God could have set the table in a different way. I put a table up this morning. We had to take the first row out. Sorry about that. You got a table here with uh, two chairs. Two chairs at the table. Now, has prepared a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Two plates. I don't have any food on the plate, but uh, the plate that David's talking about is loaded with food, right? It's a place that, a fellowship, the place where God would meet David, and it was in the presence of his enemies. Uh, he could have had, you know, considering all the enemies David had, he could have put the plate, the uh, table in some kind of room that had a window seat and they could sit there and eat while God just wiped out all David's enemies. Right? That's not where the table is, is it? Where's the table? <laughs> right in the middle of all the enemies. That's where you're going to eat your, your bread of fellowship with God in the midst of all your enemies. And there's only two chairs. I mean, the enemy wants to, to make it a third chair, right? He wants to join you in the Lord. Uh, you got to make sure he doesn't get anywhere near the table because this is a table between you and the Lord, and that's it. Thou hast prepared for me a table in the presence of my enemies. God puts it this way because he doesn't want to sequester us and extract us out of a, the broken world we live in. He leaves us right in the middle of that world. And while you're in the middle of all the chaos around you that's swirling around and the enemies, you can almost picture if it, we're, we're still talking about sheep, the sheep are there with the shepherd. As long as they're with the shepherd, they're eating, they're enjoying their time, but around them are all the enemies lurking in the bushes, right? The serpents and the, and the wolves are there looking for a time to attack. But as long as the shep shepherd is with the sheep, they're in good shape. They're in good shape. See, David lived this. This isn't like theoretical. This is what happened in David's life. Seven days a week, 365 and a quarter days a year. Let the arrows fly day, by, day and night, and there's uh, persecution and difficulty, and you get fired from jobs, you get passed over for other jobs, you receive a cancer diagnosis, you have a loved one who passes. You have strife in your family. And the shepherd prepares a table for you. For you to fellowship with him in the midst. It's a beautiful thing about it and why we put this table here today. It's a table for two. It's for you and God to fellowship with each other. 
want you to just have a mental picture of what that looks like. The enemy surrounds the table, and in that presence of my enemies, I just imagine the arrows being shot all around, the stresses, the heartaches, the hardships, the difficult challenges, the bumps in the road. All things are happening, and you're fellowshipping with the Lord in the midst of it. That's, that's beautiful. That's the only place that you're going to find peace. People are trying to undermine you. People are tr trying to misrepresent you. They impugn your character. They say things about you that are untrue. All your enemies, and you're right in the middle of it. And the Lord says, George, I've prepared a table for you. Come and sit down. Are you hungry today? What, what have you been up to today? Tell me about your day. Let's talk. Do you have enough? Uh, I've got some more for you, he's telling tell me. Uh, 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 the plate's always full at his table. He's always giving me more and more of that special relationship that we have with each other. That's the shepherd and the sheep. Think about the invitation that David's calling us to, that God is inviting us to a table with himself, the king, Right in the middle of the battle, we have a new tablecloth and a feast set on it and a table with our king. We have an opportunity to do one of two things. We have the opportunity to accept this invitation and join him in this intimacy with the Almighty or make the mistake that a lot of us make is uh, we're just too busy to spend the time at the table, right? Uh, I know the table's there. Jesus is always ready to fellowship with us. There's always a lot of food on the table, but hey, I, Lord, I'd love to stay. I got a few things going on today. Um, don't, don't really have time to dine with you right now. Uh, we'll catch you later. Hey, is, can I take a to-go box with me? You know, like, uh, take a few things with me. Yeah, let, give me a to-go box. We'll, we'll get together later uh, when I got more time. There are a lot of situations in your world right now that you can't control and absolutely can dis can't decide whether or not you want intimacy with the Almighty right at this particular time. David, in another psalm, Psalm 34 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. God is a good God. He's always ready to fellowship with us. A gracious God, a God of abundance. Who, he is kind and he, wants, he says to us, I want to put the whole spread out for you. We know immediately that he is not a God of scarcity. We have a God who has a storehouse that's full. It's not what's on the table. We know it's, it's him that's precious. Right? It's not the meal that's precious. It's not just the fellowship that's precious. It's that he's willing to spend time with us. And we're too busy. David was wise enough to realize uh, he prepares the table in the presence of my enemies. The enemies will always be there, right? <laughs> the enemies are always up to their no good, their mischief, their deeds, their schemes. They're always going to be there. The problems are always going to be around me. I'm wise when I sit down and eat with him and fellowship with him. Thou preparest the table in the presence of my enemies. Taste and see. Lord, why do you put the table in the presence of mine enemies? Why do you do it? Couldn't you have done it a different way? This morning I want to hit four reasons why God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And that's a, not a table in God's presence, but in the pre presence of my enemies. Why God's invitation to a table of abundance with the Almighty is extended in the middle of the fight in the presence of all the problems. As we, as we read from Psalm 34, here's what David writes. It's, it's about 11 chapters later in the book of Psalms. Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. Where is he 
Where is my soul going to boast? Where is my mentality going to boast? It's going to be in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Now, this isn't like a one time delving into this particular topic by David. This is David's life. This is his testimony. If you study the scriptures and look at the life of David, there was no one on, on the human realm without the, you know, save the Lord Jesus Christ, there was no one who faced more adversity than David did. And he realized he could not handle it without going to God because God was his rock. God was his strength. God is the refuge that he would go to. The table was prepared in the presence of his enemies because David always needed to fellowship with God regardless of the circumstances. And my question is, what about us? <laughs> what about us? If David needed it, do we need it? Amen. Amen. So four answers to the important question. Why, is, why does God pre prepare the table before me in the presence of mine enemies? Why here? Why in the midst of all the trouble is that that's the place that God wants to fellowship with us? Uh, first, so that we can linger with the Savior. In a world that doesn't linger very often at anything. They, say, they used to say, if a page didn't load on your computer, how long would you wait until you hit something else to get out of it? It used to be seven seconds. It's probably shorter than that now, right? It doesn't load in three seconds. I'm off somewhere else. We don't linger at anything, do we? We're watching something, and uh, it's a, it's a three-minute video. We don't have time for the three-minute video. I, I got it. I know what the video is about, you know? Uh, Carol's forever getting these golden retriever videos. And I hear the music, and it's going through all the way through. I'm thinking, most people would have been gone, but she loves the retriever so much that she watches the whole thing, right? We barely linger at anything. We're losing our ability to pay attention to anything for more than a few seconds. And here David says, Thou hast prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Why? For you to come apart from all the craziness and the chaos around you and come to a place where God's going to meet you and you're going to be blessed by that time and he's going to bless you. You're going to receive that blessing and it's going to change your life. But you know, I got things to do today. Uh, oh, look at the time. That's where we are. And I'm asking our congregation, our church, to be different. To say, my time with the Savior is too important to just sandwich it in between three other things. You know, I, I, I've got a meeting at, I think I got, I got about five minutes to look at God's Word today. Okay, you need to clear out some things. Because the table there in many of our lives has only Jesus on one side and the other side's empty because we're so busy doing what we're doing. No wonder our lives are so shallow. No wonder our lives are so empty. We don't have time to share with the shepherd, the shepherd of your soul. Yeah, I've trusted in Jesus Christ. I can tell you when I did, but, you know, I'm really busy right now. Don't really have time to fellowship with him. So the first reason that he puts this table in the presence of an enemy so that he, we can linger with the Savior the invitation is to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. So don't just keep coming to church and singing the worship songs. How about sitting down with the one to whom all the worship songs 
or about. I'm highlighting my favorite verse, and I can't wait to Instagram this to all my friends. How about praying to the Lord and asking Him to share with you how this verse is going to change your life? How's, it, how's this going to change me, Lord? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in the Lord in the midst of his enemies. It's here so that we can respond to the invitation to linger with the Savior in the midst of the problems, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the difficulty that we're going to set our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, it says in Hebrews, that we're going to consider higher things in our life, as it says in the book of Colossians. We're going to actually fix our eyes on Jesus and see him as the author and finisher of our faith and that his time with him is more important than anything else on my schedule. <clears throat> it's an invitation to linger with the shepherd that David spent so much time with, to linger in a world that doesn't like to linger. Uh, we have to have the mental mentality that says, taste and see that the Lord is good, to linger with the, the Almighty. That's the first answer to the question, why does he put the table in the presence of my enemies? Second, so that we can know that God is enough. So that we can know that God is enough. We've been lingering with the Savior, and we're uh, also in the midst of our enemies. Things begin to happen. And as we continue to fellowship with Him and continue to go to the table that He's prepared for us in the presence of our enemies... He keeps reminding me, it looks bad, but I got this taken care of. Nothing will touch you that, that I haven't allowed to come into your life. And by spending time with me in the presence of your enemies, you're constantly getting my perspective on how things are going. I'm listening to you, but you're also listening to me. Listen, none of us want difficulty. None of us want... Moments in life that we have to ask, who in the world has got my back? There's always going to be one that has our back. None of us want problems, but we look back on the markers of our spiritual journey and we see it's always at those points of problems and greatest difficulty that our shepherd was with us. Have you noticed that? If you've been walking with the Lord any period of time, you know the troubles that came into your life, the difficulties you're going through, when you thought everything was spinning out of control and all you did was just hold on to Jesus during that time, you remember that he was there for you. David remembered that too. Uh, he, will, he, he was determined that he was not going to neglect his relationship with God because it was a lifeline for him. He couldn't. He couldn't. He realized how important it was. He was in a precarious situation, king of Israel. His own son led a rebellion against him. The former king before him was so jealous about him that he chased him all around the country trying to kill him. David needed to learn to trust in the Lord. How much more do we do today? Right now, the moments we would point back to are the moments we would say it was right there that we realized that God was real. Uh, until we are in that time of testing, until we're in that time of pressure, it's all pretty theoretical, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, this is what a, a person of faith does in the midst of that difficulty. It's almost like we're studying it out of a textbook. That's a case number 372, all right? This is what a believer does when he's in trouble. Until we're in the middle of trouble. And that's why he puts the table right in the presence of our enemies. So you remember, in the chaos around you, I'm always going to be there, and there's always going to be a time for us to, to talk about it, to fellowship about it, and I'm going to give you a perspective that you're not going to see, and I'm going to save you out of all your fears. It's right here that we realize what faith is all about. 
the faith that people have been telling us about all our lives. When the pressure comes and the, the sky collapses and all of a sudden you're facing the tremendous obstacle that you never wanted and here it is, there he is in the presence of your enemies and he's time for us to fellowship with each other. Those are the times where we actually discover that God is sovereign and that God is in control. It's right there that we realize when the bottom falls out that God will catch us. It was just right there that we honestly, for the first time, claim, came, claimed it as our faith. And it wasn't somebody else's faith because we saw with our own eyes and our own lives how God came through for us. It becomes our faith. So the table is here so that we can know that he is enough. The table was away. If, it, if the table was set somewhere else, way away from our enemies, <laughs> we might forget that he's enough. In the presence of my enemies, I remember he's enough for whatever obstacle I face. Uh, do you remember uh, it was 2 Kings chapter 6? Elisha and his servants are being chased by the king of Aram, if you guys remember that chapter, uh, the uh, king of Aram says, how in the world does Israel seem to always get my plan? Like we, we come up with this plan and all of a sudden Israel knows what we're doing. And he's asking his advisors and he said, it's that prophet, Elisha. Elisha, he just talks to the Lord and all of a sudden he knows what we're doing. So he sends an army to get Elisha. The morning comes up, it's ch chapter 6, about verse 15, 16, 17. The, the sun comes up that day, the servant goes out, Elijah comes back, Elijah, we're surrounded by the army of the king of Aram. It, it, here's what the passage says in verses 15 to 17. The prophet's attendant uh, got up early in the morning and he went outside. There was an army surrounding the city, all along with the horses and the chariots. He said to Elisha, oh no, my master, what will we do? Elisha replied, don't be afraid, for our side outnumbers them. Then Elisha prayed, oh Lord. Now, does he pray, oh Lord, wipe out all the people around the city? No, he says, oh Lord, open my servant's eyes so that he can see. The Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw the hill was full of horses and chariots of fire, fire around the armies of the king of Aram. God allowed them to see all that surrounded their army was even greater than the army that was attacking. Elijah does what? Does he freak out? No. Why doesn't Elisha act like the servant? Because Elijah goes to the table. He knows his God. He knows that greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And nobody's going to touch me that God hasn't preordained and given a reason why it should be done that way. <clears throat> God is surrounding everything that we do. His forces are around and they are greater than the forces that we face every day. He's enough and the story plays out. Those enemies did not have a, a, the great advantage they thought they had. They always think they have the advantage over us. The enemies of God's people always think they have the advantage and they never do. They're deluded because God is enough. The table is here so we can remember that God's enough. Third reason why the table's here, we, one was to linger with the Savior. The second was to know that God is enough. Third is so our enemies can see that God is enough. See, if the table was somewhere else, the enemies wouldn't see how God, well God takes care of us. <laughs> he puts it in the presence of the enemies because the enemies are scratching their head and saying... We have these people. We're, we're, give, we're torturing them at work every day, and this person comes in with a smile on their face. They, in the break room, 
you're the person they're talking about. As soon as you walk in, everybody looks down their coffee and stops talking. The enemies continue to devise and make the plan how they're going to hamstring you and bring you to nothing. God puts the table right in the presence of all that so we might know that as long as we're walking with the king, we have his protection, don't we? And they come to know that our God is enough. Maybe our enemies think we're, we're shooting all our arrows at them. They're doing everything to take us out, and our enemies are saying, okay, we got them. Break where we want them. They're going to break any day. They're attacking you every day at work. They're attacking you every day at whatever organization you're going to. And they're expecting you to come in with a dour look on your face of defeat. And every day you come in with a smile. <laughs> and why? Because you've been sitting at the table. God's changing you. He's giving you a strength inside of yourselves, a confidence that he's got you. He's going to take care of the situation. They're thinking any minute now they're going to give up. Any minute this whole thing is going to go up in smoke. And then what's going on? Eating with the king, we become more like the king. And it is by his grace we say to our enemies, it isn't what we want in life, the trouble, but in the midst of our trouble, he's always with us. Remember Paul and Silas, Acts 16? They're in prison. It was midnight. What were they doing? <laughs> Singing praises to God. They were at the table that night, fellowshipping with God. And what did it say to all the prisoners with them? <laughs> In the presence of their enemies, they were fellowshipping with God. So they could hear. These people are locked in stocks. And they're praising the Lord at midnight. And the earthquake came, and the, the jailer comes in, and he comes away knowing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What must I do to be saved, he says. So that's why the table is there in the presence of our enemies. So that our enemies might know that he's enough. It's a witness to them how God takes care of his children. As we continue to live for him in the presence of his, his glory, reflecting that radiance. Remember in Psalm 34, they see the radiant faces. What gives you a radiant face when you're in the midst of difficulty? Only God does that, right? And when people see that, they start saying, huh, either this person's like really got a mental problem. <laughs> Or there's something about this person that I don't quite understand. And they come to find out that radiance in their face, there's no shame on their face. That's what David says in Psalm 34. The radiance in their face comes from spending time with the Savior. Their shepherd gives them those radiant faces. Whatever the circumstance, let's praise the Lord together. And Paul and Silas are whether it's noonday and we're in a city square or it's midnight and we're in a prison, we're going to praise the Lord. And God uses that. And their faces were radiant because they were sitting at the table. They were worshiping God in the middle of the fight. We can linger with the Savior. We can know God is enough. Our enemies can know God is enough. And the fourth is so that our enemies can see our cup overflows. God lets others see that the cup of those who trust God and those who belong to God and always are uh, seeking his uh, face and continuing to fellowship with him, God has a way of making our cups continue to fill up and overflow. And our enemies are able to see that. Our cup overflows and we're able to help somebody else. If we had food here today, we could say to our enemies, do you want some? i got plenty here. Take some. Because you know what? By the time I get back to the table, my shepherd's going to fill that plate up again. 
I could give that away 70 times and I come back to the table and Jesus is never going to say to me when I come back, what did you give away that plate for? He's going to say, oh, here's some more so you can give away more. Blessed are those who give rather than those who receive. So I thought those words out of verse 5 would be a blessing for us tonight, today. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I don't know what difficulties you guys are facing in your lives today, but I want you to, to know the wisest thing you can do is spend time with the Lord during this time. That he's the one who's going to help you get through this difficult time. Two plates, two chairs at the table. He's always ready for us to fellowship with him. Let's take advantage of those opportunities. Become more like David in that regard. When it gets to the book of Acts and says that David was a man after his own heart, I think this is one of the biggest reasons why he was a man after God's own heart. Because he put his relationship with the Lord as a priority and he recognized he totally needed that time with Jesus and that time with the shepherd every day. And that's what made David different. Honoring his word, living in a way that's pleasing to the shepherd was all David really was motivated by. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you, Lord, for uh, this great Psalm 23. And as we had some time to think about the table that's prepared in the presence of our enemies, we recognize, Lord, that we are so blessed. Surely goodness and his loving kindness follow us all the days of our lives because of he's the shepherd. He knows how much we tend to wander. He knows how much we can get in trouble. He knows how scared we are sometimes about the circumstances around us. In the midst of all that that, he, that you understand about us, Lord, you've made a way for us to fellowship. You died on the cross for our sins so that we, our sins might be forgiven, that our great shepherd laid down his life for his sheep, and now he desires to walk with us every day. Help us to be wise enough to walk with the king today and be a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just help us stand and sing living hope. <clears throat>